I told you I would define the word opioid. Well, is it opioid or is it opiate? Well, an opiate, by definition, it's a drug that occurs naturally. It's found in opium. Examples, morphine, codeine, couple others. That's an opiate. Opioids, it includes these. It's a broader term. It includes these, but also includes semi-synthetic opioids. These are derived from this. Examples, heroin, remember, morphine, stick two molecules on it. Percocet, Vicodin, Dilaudid, buprenorphine, semi-synthetic. Starts as a naturally occurring substance. Fully synthetic opioids, completely man-made. Methadone, here's another difference between buprenorphine and methadone. Semi-synthetic, fully synthetic. Demerol, synthetic. Fentanyl, tramadol. I'm going to pause on tramadol for a moment. There are many physicians who don't know that tramadol is an opioid. It goes to exactly the same receptors that morphine goes to, that oxycodone goes to. And I've had um, physicians, I've heard of physicians who will give the patient a prescription for tramadol and say, here, this is fine, not addictive, this is okay. You had a problem with uh, oxycodone? Well, here, this is safe. No, no, no. I have one patient in the practice, 56, 57 years old. He's on Suboxone because of tramadol addiction. He could not stop taking tramadol. He had the same withdrawal symptoms as somebody with heroin or oxycodone. So I'm taking that moment to pause about tramadol. Spread that word out there. All opioids are not the same. Full versus partial agonist. Most people do not know the word agonist. Can I get some nodding heads here that people don't know the word agonist? Yeah. So we know what an antagonist is. It's an antagonist is something or someone who opposes an action. That's an antagonist. When an opioid <laughs> antagonist attaches to the receptor in the brain, it blocks or prevents any opioid from attaching. Examples, naloxone, N Narcan is the brand name, and naltrexone. Those are opioid antagonists. An agonist is something that does an action. Two kinds of, of agonists. There's a full opioid agonist. When a full opioid agonist attaches to the receptor, it allows the receptor to manifest everything that the receptor is capable of doing. That includes pain control, pupils, release of dopamine. This Focus in on this one, release of dopamine. Examples, Percocet, Oxycodone, Vicodin, Heroin, Methadone, full, full agonist. This is from, a, I gave you a, a pamphlet <coughs> from the Suboxone manufacturer. This is the newer one. This picture is from an older pamphlet, but you can also find it online, and this is in your handout. And it says, when an opioid attaches to an opioid receptor, this white stuff, these white crosses here, that's dopamine. When dopamine gets released, that's what causes the pleasurable feelings to produce, the sense of euphoria, the sense of being high. That's a full agonist. When the opioid leaves the receptor, now there's no more dopamine, and that's when the pleasure fades. Now that's when you can start getting withdrawal symptoms and cravings. It's a full agonist. In addition to the full agonist, there's a partial agonist. Partial agonist attaches to the receptor. It's still an opioid. It still attaches to the same receptor. It's like the lock and key, but the key just fits partially into that receptor. It doesn't fill it completely. Partial agonist allows the receptor to manifest only some of its capabilities. Pain control constricted pupils, no release of dopamine. Example, buprenorphine. Buprenorphine is a partial agonist. Again, methadone is a full agonist. So you can get off on, on methadone. You can't get off on, on, on buprenorphine. And I'll explain that here further. Another picture, buprenorphine is a partial agonist. When buprenorphine attaches, it attaches to exactly the same receptor that a full agonist does, that methadone and, and heroin attach to. But the, because there's no dopamine release, that's why there's very little or no sense of being high. Okay? But as far as the brain is concerned, the brain says, oh, my opioid receptor is filled up. 
because my opioid receptor is filled up, I don't have to have any withdrawal symptoms and I don't have to have any cravings. So that's how buprenorphine can block that withdrawal and craving. Also, because there's no dopamine release, that's why there's no tolerance with buprenorphine. In the first session, I showed how tolerance develops. And it's because you're beating the hell out of your dopamine system. That's where you reduce supplies, you reduce output, and you're depleting the dopamine stores, you're depleting or shutting down dopamine receptors. Again, because there's no dopamine release, that's why there's no tolerance with Suboxone or buprenorphine. There are people, the, the dose at year three is the same as it was at month three. And sometimes it's actually even lower. That's that reverse tolerance business. Interesting, buprenorphine is also a partial antagonist. What that means is that the buprenorphine attaches more firmly to that receptor than almost any other opioid. At adequate doses, it blocks other opioids from attaching, so it discourages abuse. What that means is, <clears throat> so you're on buprenorphine. Life gets tough. You're really stressed. You're really having a hard time. Somebody comes up to you right at that moment with some Percocet in their hands, and they'll go, hey, man, I've got some good stuff here. You want some good stuff? And at that moment, you might just go, mm, yeah, the hell with it. Well, that Percocet cannot displace the buprenorphine from the receptor because the buprenorphine attaches more firmly than just about any other opioid. There are some exceptions. Okay? So by blocking it, be, I, if it can't attach, you're not going to get off on that Percocet. Therefore, it discourages abuse. But there's a potential problem here. If you're still going, if you're still feeling really crappy, you might go, oh man, that didn't do anything. Let me try another. <sighs> still nothing. Let me try another. You try to override the buprenorphine? Well, it, buprenorphine does not block the breathing center. So you can keep trying to take more and more heroin or Percocet or whatever to override the buprenorphine and put, just give yourself an overdose and stop breathing. But again, this discourages abuse. Naloxone. Why is it in Suboxone? Because remember, Suboxone is buprenorphine plus naloxone. So why is it in there? Naloxone, Narcan, full antagonist. <coughs> so I'm doing heroin. I've got an overdose. I'm barely breathing. I'm this close to death. They take me to the ER. The first thing they're going to give me is some IV Narcan. It's like a miracle drug. If you haven't gotten a response, well, I used to work in ER when I was a resident, right? If you have not gotten a response in one to two minutes, you dose again. That's how quickly it works. So you're barely breathing, you're barely breathing, you get the Narcan, and then all of a sudden, <gasps> and you start breathing again. That's the good news. The bad news is, the reason you got breathing again is that Narcan knocks every opioid off every receptor you got, including the breathing center. So it immediately throws you <laughs> into precipitated withdrawal. I've known of patients, of people who uh, get the Narcan, and they bitch about the fact you you, you ruined my high, but you're alive to bitch about it. There's a big movement around the country to now provide Narcan to first responders so that police, EMTs, fire department can have uh, Narcan available. It can be given injection. It can also be given as a nasal spray. Um, so you don't have to wait to get to the ER. They can give it to you at the scene. Some places are giving uh, Narcan to friends and relatives of addicts. So it can be used and save lives. Many lives have already been saved with that. That's, it's a trend spreading around the country. Again, cost is a limiting factor, but that's Narcan or Naloxone. When you take Suboxone under your tongue like you're supposed to, there's very little to no Naloxone actually absorbed into your system. So there's no real effect from it. But if you try to abuse Suboxone, and people can abuse anything, you can abuse, you can crush a, a generic Suboxone pill, you can try to dissolve the Suboxone film, and you try to inject it, and people do that. Oh, now you're getting that Naloxone IV, and that's going to throw you into withdrawal. 
and it therefore discourages abusing Suboxone. That's what it's in there for. Another safety factor with buprenorphine, the ceiling effect. This is from SAMHSA. This is one of the slides that they use to train physicians, a curriculum for physicians about how to use buprenorphine. So in this slide, this is receptor activation. So this is no receptor activation all the way up to 100% or full receptor activation. Forget this log dose business. This just means increased dose of buprenorphine. Okay. So here's naloxone. Naloxone is a pure antagonist, and that means that there is zero activation of the opioid receptor. When you have a full agonist, and I give the example here, they give the example of methadone, you take more and more and you get full 100% activation of that receptor. Buprenorphine is only a partial agonist, so if you can take a little, you get some effect. You take a little more, you get some effect. If you take, and you only get a partial activation of that receptor. So if you take more and more, the, the person who takes five suboxone instead of two, you're peeing out the excess. You're not getting any more effect. And this is this provides a safety factor, and this is a, a safety factor for respiratory um, depression. Any place you'd like. Mm -hmm. So again, it's a very safe drug. Now, I have to mention one thing here. This business about you don't get high on it. This applies to an experienced user. If you give me a buprenorphine right now, I'm going to get high on it. With an experienced user, though, there's no high. There's no dopamine release. Another factor here, here's another difference between methadone and buprenorphine. Every year, there is a very significant number of overdose deaths due to methadone. Okay. I know of no reported overdose deaths from suboxone or buprenorphine in an experienced user when they take just suboxone, just buprenorphine. Mix the suboxone with benzodiazepines like Xanax, Clonopin, Valium, that kind of stuff. Mix it with that or mix it with large amounts of alcohol. Mm, now you can get one plus one equals three or four. That might be an ER trip or an overdose. But taken alone, this is where the safety piece of that um, um, ceiling effect comes into play. So again, safe drug, difference between methadone and buprenorphine. Since buprenorphine blocks all the opioid receptors, what do I do if I bust my leg? What do I do if I have to have elective surgery? How do I manage that? Well, for acute pain, carry a wallet card. You know, whatever, you come to an ER and you can't communicate with them, they're going to go through your wallet looking for ID, and they'll find this card. And they'll say, dear healthcare provider, I'm taking buprenorphine, I'm taking suboxone. If they know that, they can now treat you differently. Now, understand that there are some ER docs and some physicians in general who don't know Suboxone, don't know about it. I had one patient, he went to the ER, he twisted his ankle, he thought he might have busted it. X-rays, no, no fracture, just a bad sprain. Acyse elevate, and the doctor comes up to him afterwards and says, okay, ASIS Elevate, here's your prescription for Percocet. Um, doc, uh, I'm on Suboxone. Mm, okay, here's your prescription for Percocet. So he took the prescription and God bless him, he came in and he brought the prescription with him and we tore it up together. But he, he, he got it. But again, some docs don't know about it. But if they do know about it, there are several options. One, you can use non-opioid med. Toradol, ibuprofen. If somebody is actively using heroin or oxycodone or some other opioid and someone were to suggest to them that you take ibuprofen for your pain, <coughs> as if, ain't gonna work. When you're taking Suboxone, ibuprofen works. It can be quite effective actually. I got some heads nodding. Yeah, surprisingly it works. Can work. Another example of something you can do, regional block, epidural, same anesthesia that ladies have when they have babies. 
When I was doing surgery, if we did big abdominal surgery or leg surgery, we'd put an epidural <coughs> catheter in, leave it in there for three days or so on a continuous pump with pain meds, no pain, and they can function and get out of bed and, and do the recovery thing. When I had my shoulder surgery, I had a shoulder block before they did the surgery. For 24 hours after the surgery, I had nothing. I said, oh, piece of cake, not a problem. 24 hours later, oh my God, it wore off. But I got 24 hours of no pain. So again, there's things you can do with a regional block. You might need to be admitted to the hospital. If these things don't work, you might need to be admitted to the hospital for pain control. You might need some kind of potent o opioid that can override the buprenorphine. Remember I said there's only a few things that can do that? One of them is IV fentanyl. Short acting, very powerful, can override buprenorphine. But you want to be someplace where they got the little thing on your finger to be sure you're still like um, breathing. And if you're in a place and they see your oxygen levels are going down, whoa, 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 they can do something about it. Now, wait a couple days, the buprenorphine blockade is going to be reduced or gone. Now they can give you whatever they need to for pain control. Follow up with your doc when you get out. You might need ongoing pain management. You need to be monitored. When you no longer need pain coverage, we get you back on buprenorphine. So that's in the emergency situation. How about elective procedures? Well, let your doctor know ahead of time. Honest to God, I had a patient call me one time urgently saying, Doc, I'm in the holding area of the OR. They're just about to take me back for surgery. What do I do for pain control? And I gave, him, gave her some suggestions, but let us know ahead of time and then we can do some planning a number of different options. One, if you're not going to need opioids for sedation or anesthesia or post-op pain, just continue the buprenorphine as needed. You can supplement with stuff like ibuprofen. Having a root canal, I'm sorry, most root canals, I've had root canals, most root canals, you don't need Percocet. Okay. Um, sometimes you do, but mostly you don't, so just keep taking the buprenorphine as usual. This is relatively new in my practice. Last year I was not doing this. But this is if you're having moderate post-op pain that's anticipated of relatively short duration. You can continue the buprenorphine and supplement with a full agonist like morphine or Vicodin. It can give you pain relief with no euphoria. So the buprenorphine still blocks the euphoria, but you can get pain relief. We're still learning about these receptors. We don't get it completely, but this is true. When you stop the agonist, there's no withdrawal. You don't have to taper off. You've still got the buprenorphine. I have had two ladies now that have had hysterectomies. They kn and I spoke, I coordinated. We, we knew about it ahead of time. I spoke each time to the OB, GYN. We coordinated our care. What a concept, coordination of care, huh? And we never stopped the buprenorphine. And then they just added a little bit of Vicodin for two, three days. Stopped it, and that's all they needed. I had one guy had to have neck surgery to remove a tumor from his neck. We never stopped the buprenorphine. They gave him a script for Vicodin afterwards. He never filled it. He didn't need it because the buprenorphine covered the pain. If you're going to have some big, bigger procedure, like an orthopedic procedure, when I had my, my shoulder surgery, that was not going to be ibuprofen. That was big time stuff. I was on Percocet and, and Vicodin for about three, four months. That's big pain. Um, I was blessed with the genetics, that's not because I'm good, and this is before I did addiction stuff, right, and not because I'm strong or powerful or whatever, but I blessed with, blessed with the genetics that I just stopped without incident. But this is where sometimes folks can get in trouble. But if you're going to need big time, severe surgery, big time pain relief, stop the buprenorphine ahead of time, and then provide full opioid coverage, morphine, oxycodone, whatever and continue it. When that happens, I usually like to take care of the pain management because the surgeons, surgeons love me when I tell them I'll take care of the pain because no, surgeons nowadays don't like to prescribe any opioids. They're all gun shy with the DEA and the medical board. So they love it when I take over because problem is the surgeons will do stuff like you've had big surgery. Vicodin, five milligrams every six hours is needed. Not. 
somebody who's had a problem with opioid addiction, they have a higher tolerance. These are folks who may need 30 milligrams every four, but I'll monitor that. I'm not going to give you a prescription for 300 uh, Percocet at once. I'm going to see you weekly or at most every two weeks. Close monitoring. Again, when you don't need coverage anymore, we get you back on the buprenorphine.